Well, greetings out there in YouTube land and welcome to today's big video extravaganza which will feature the repair and testing of the contents of these two boxes and by the shape and heft I have a feeling this is a good sized uh, fender uh, amp chassis probably uh, a baseman uh, a bandmaster twin or something of the sort uh, so without further ado let's open the box and see what our mission is for the next few days well, boy is it beautifully packed with these big high density foam blocks uh, completely surrounding the uh, chassis so um, I have a feeling it probably arrived in really good shape so let's get it out and take a look looking down in here at this galvanized chassis this isn't a fender amp at all okay so uh, boy the suspense is building let's get it out and take a look at what it really is first off uh, the smaller box contains the tube set it looks like it's going to be pretty high grade uh, the chassis itself looks like a fender clone to me but unfortunately we have a letter that came with it let's see what the owner has to say well let's see the letter says that it uh, worked well for years started at volume fluctuation uh, with a fizzy sound generally unstable ordered a whole new set of tubes which made no difference whatsoever um, he feels that the problem is in the output section tubes are new but he wants a set of new 5881s apparently the tubes that he bought were 7581s I, I'm not really familiar with that tube um, he wants it back to stock original condition and um, that's it uh, no mention of who built the amp or where it came from uh, I'll do some investigating and figure that out but uh, meanwhile let's get started well after doing some research on the internet and checking with uh, past correspondence with the owner of the amp it turns out this is a Victoria clone of a narrow panel 5F4 Tweed Super Amp model 35210 uh, apparently they identically duplicated the 5F4 circuit with the addition of a bias trim pot and a couple test points uh, this uh, chassis came in a cabinet with two 10 inch eminent speakers and cost around twenty eight hundred dollars okay now I've, naturally I think we've all heard of Victoria amps I've never worked on one but uh, this should be an interesting opportunity uh, so uh, let's go ahead and and take a look at this inside and out and see what we think of it at the end of course after the repairs have been made uh, then we will hear an audio demonstration and see for ourselves what a twenty eight hundred dollar uh, Victoria a 5F4 clone sounds like. That sounds appealing. Stay tuned. Cruising down the galvanized chassis, we see good size filter choke and a really stout output transformer. The numbers on them really don't ring any bells with me. They don't look like Mercury Magnetics or Hammond numbers. Um, one observation is that they've left one of the outputs disconnected from the output transformer I'm assuming that's probably the 8 ohm output and they have the 4 ohm connected because remember this uses two 10 inch speakers uh, probably both 8 ohm for a, a 4 net uh, impedance um, okay you see the primary wiring for the output transformer and then a monster of a power transformer I'll tell you they didn't skimp on the transformers for this jewel. Tip it up here we'll look at the control panel and it is an aftermarket chrome tweed control panel for the Fender Super Amp. Four inputs uh, delineated bright and normal one pair for each. Then we have separate volume controls depending on which pair of inputs you use typical uh, treble and bass tone controls but also a presence control which is interesting uh, on a tweed amp 
blue um, jewel uh, for the uh, indicator light. We've got a standby switch. Three amps, um, fairly high current draw uh, for the fuse and no ground switch is necessary because this uh, was built in the days of three wire power cords and no need for that uh, polarity nonsense. 5U4 rectifier, 25881s, and uh, two 12AX7s and a 12AY7. Okay, there's retainers on the large tube bases, but uh, all looks pretty straightforward other than the surfacing here, the finish of the metal, it's not really unlike a fender chassis. Now let's flip it over and take a look at the wiring. All very nicely done as is befitting a boutique amp of this price. Very nicely wired. JH probably was responsible for the point-to-point -point wiring. I've looked up some pictures of these on the internet and the choice of capacitors, everything about it, the wire, uh, wiring, routing, all of that is identical to the one in the picture I saw on the internet. So uh, I'm guessing this one is completely unmolested from when it left the factory. And uh, I'm going to use the Fender Super Amp layout diagram and the 5F4 schematic for a check in the circuit. I reviewed the um, Victoria literature on the amp and they said that there were only two differences between the original circuit and theirs and I see one of them here. It looks like an adjustable bias control pot. Um, Okay, well, I know that's going to come in handy, and it's a really nice touch. The snuff. But remember, this beast was apparently damaging output tubes. Um, so we have to think there might be something wrong in the bias circuit that is uh, providing the uh, negative DC grid bias to our output tubes. If that failed, then there would be nothing suppressing runaway plate current within the output tubes and they would sort of self-destruct in short order as apparently these did. Okay, so that's where we'll start our investigation. I recall that the Victoria literature uh, said that besides the uh, bias pot they had also included some uh, measurement or test points in the circuit to assist in biasing and I believe this is what they're speaking of. Instead of simply grounding the cathodes as, as the circuit uh, normally would be uh, constructed, they've run precision one ohm resistors between the cathode and ground. So these essentially serve as grounding straps for the cathodes, but if you hook your voltmeter across them, uh, you can measure the voltage drop across that one ohm resistor and uh, get an, a fairly accurate uh, estimate of the plate current. Okay, and that of course will assist you in setting the bias pot. One improvement I see already is that uh, Victoria has blocked off the hole where the external speaker jack would normally be on a fender chassis. Now this is a real weakness I think in fender uh, circuits because if you leave the cabinet speaker plugged into this jack and you plug in an external speaker, your uh, net speaker impedance is going to go way down, okay, and it cause a mismatch with your output transformer. So uh, by blocking off that external speaker, they're forcing you to do an either or decision. You either use the cabinet speaker or you unplug it and plug in an external speaker, hopefully of the same impedance, and that way you're protecting the circuit. I noticed that Victoria uh, retained the 0.05 microfarad cap on the standby switch uh, to silence that loud pop that sometimes you'll hear when you flip the switch. 
And uh, the, the reason you hear the pop is, is as the points of the switch separate, the contacts, the electricity can jump across that gap uh, when it's fairly, uh, the two contacts are close together, making a very loud pop, which I know we've all heard. By putting a capacitor here, you give the electricity another place to go rather than jumping the arc and making a pop, it can go in here uh, to charge up that uh, little capacitor. They also included the death cap, which, you know, everybody's always anxious to remove them, but they've installed one here. It's right in the primary circuit of the power transformer, and there it is, a 0.05 microfarad capacitor to ground. Apparently they feel that it's worthwhile having this to eliminate uh, radio frequency interference and other noise from the circuit. Um, you know, if that cap checks out, I'll probably leave it. Let's take a few moments out from today's repair project to open this gift box uh, from a viewer and friend named Michael at ShellyAmps at gmail.com. Uh, he's been kind enough to help me with the work overload on amp repairs lately. And on top of that, he also sent me a gift. So let's open this and see what it is. Well, it came with a nice letter. Apparently he bought this for himself, but uh, hasn't used it that much. So he thought maybe I would and uh, possibly feature it in a future video. Okay, so uh, without further ado, let's see what the gift is. It's beautifully packed, so I'm going to set the camera down, remove all of the bubble wrap, and we'll see what lurks within. Well, check this out. It's a Heathkit model IT28 high voltage capacitor tester. Now, I had one of these years ago and foolishly sold it, but this was for many years the acid test for capacitor leakage. It actually charges them up to their full operating um, voltage and then measures uh, tiny amounts of leakage if it is present. Now I'm going to have to uh, download the manual for this so that I know that I'm operating it correctly. We see the probes right here. But uh, once I master this device, I'm thinking it would be very useful uh, to make a video contrasting the accuracy and uh, efficacy of this type of high voltage capacitor tester compared to uh, an ESR meter and also to testing uh, the capacitors in circuit with one of the leads removed from the circuit. Okay, so there's three different methods that I'm aware of and uh, we can compare them and see uh, which is the best, which is the most accurate, uh, and which suits us uh, for our practical use. So if that sounds interesting, uh, keep an eye on future video releases, uh, and I hope to have a video uh, covering the three uh, capacitance testers in the near future. Let's get started on our diagnosis and treatment of our patient today, the Victoria clone of the Fender Super Amp. Uh, remember that the uh, owner's uh, comments uh, centered on problems with the output tubes, which could be attributed to faulty uh, bias um, voltage being applied to the grids. On the original uh, Fender circuit, they used a selenium rectifier. We see that uh, Victoria has replaced that wisely with a diode. We also see the trim pot here. So uh, let's hook up our test leads to the grids of the two 6L6s. Uh, turn on the amp. There really doesn't need to be uh, any other tubes or anything uh, installed in this. Turn it on and see what kind of negative DC bias voltage is being applied to the grids as the amp stands right now. Although it's hard to read, it appears that the schematic shows us that it should be negative 40 volts DC. Let's see what happens when we turn on the amp. Pilot lights on. And let's watch what happens. Well, 
looks to me like the bias voltage is, if anything, a little higher than uh, what we saw in the schematic, which you'd think then would suppress the plate current and actually protect the tubes rather than put them at risk. Well, um, as delivered, uh, the bias voltage is very nicely balanced, negative uh, 49.4 volts DC. Let's um, go in here and alter that bias voltage with our little uh, bias pot and uh, see if the bias pod is functioning properly. Okay, let's watch the um, voltmeters vary as I adjust that bias trim pod. And as you can see, they both respond equally and very smoothly to those adjustments. So it would appear that the diode, the trim pot, and the uh, two resistors uh, between the bias voltage and the two pins uh, for the grids uh, are all functioning just right. They're balanced and uh, I see no fault there. So with this simple test we verified that the bias circuit is working properly. Uh, we see here that from uh, this winding uh, in the power transformer secondary we come up here through a 6800 ohm resistor through that diode that we saw that replaced the um, selenium rectifier. Um, we see that the 56k resistor must be correct. The electrolytic filter cap is working properly and we're getting uh, a balanced a negative DC bias supply uh, delivered to our tube grids. We know that since it's balanced that the 1500 ohm and the 220 K ohm resistors must both be equal. Okay, in total uh, resistance. So um, we can rule that out as a uh, cause of the problem. The customer has provided a, a brand new SED 5U4G black plate uh, rectifier tube from the tube store but uh, what I find in the box looks like 5U3C. Now I, I am not real familiar with the Cyrillic alphabet but um, this is not marked 5U4 in any way. What I'm going to do is plug in an NOS 5U4 uh, of my own into the tube, uh, the rectifier socket, see what the results are, then plug in this tube that was provided by the owner and see if the results are the same. If so, then we'll continue to use that uh, Russian tube that uh, the owner provided. Now the next possibility is that the plate voltage being delivered to the 6L6s is not equal. There may be uh, a fault here in the primary of the output transformer. Something of that sort that uh, gives us some sort of asymmetric uh, plate voltage. Okay, so let's plug in our 5U4 rectifier and then measure the plate voltage that is being delivered to both of the tube sockets. Now because there are no tubes in place and no plate current uh, taking uh, that is flowing. Uh, we're going to get a very high readings, but still we want to see that they are equal. Okay, so let's get out the uh, 5U4, plug it in, and uh, do our test. All right, our NOS RCA 5U4 is in place. Uh, I've got my uh, test probes connected to the plates of each of the 6L6s. Let's turn on the circuit and see what type of plate voltage we're looking at. Now like I said it's going to be real high because no current is flowing. Well that's a, exactly what I would expect. Uh, when current starts flowing this is going to drop down to like 440, 450. Uh, look how evenly balanced it is. Okay so uh, let's try that Russian 5U4 and see if we get exactly the same result. The monster Russian tube is in place. It's obviously a rectifier. You see the two large plates. Okay, so let's go ahead and switch this on. 
and see what type of plate voltage it provides. And it appears to be about the same. So apparently it is indeed a 5U4 rectifier and it is working properly. So now we can trust it. Now if you're wondering why I'm being so cautious here and not plugging tubes in until uh, each step proves that uh, there is no problem, uh, remember that the uh, owner said that he felt he destroyed at least one or two output tubes uh, by plugging them into this circuit, so I'm trying to prevent any damage and by leaving the tubes out it makes it real hard for them to be damaged. Now though that we see that the bias voltage, the plate voltage being applied to the two uh, 6L6 sockets is correct. I'm going to use my Eurotubes bias probes, plug them in, and we're going to see exactly what the bias uh, level is on these tubes. What is their plate voltage and what is their plate current? And then we can calculate their plate dissipation. Now the next question to arise is the nature of these 7581A replacement tubes. To be honest, I'm not familiar with them. I tend to use uh, vintage tubes myself. Um, but So I'm going to have to go in on the internet and do some research to gain a fuller understanding of, of how these tubes perform, what their parameters are. All right, I've gone to the tube store uh, to their uh, description of the 7581A vacuum tube and you can read what they say here. Apparently it offers more clean headroom, they say. It's an upgraded 6L6GC. It has a plate dissipation rating of 35 watts, which is 5 watts higher than the 6L6GC. Um, it can be used in any 6L6 based tube circuit. Also, the tube uh, received five-star ratings from users, and uh, it sounds to me like it's a valid choice. So let's go plug them in and see how they work. We see that the 7581As are plugged into the Eurotubes test probes and plugged into their respective sockets. Uh, I've also connected us to an 8-ohm speaker to provide protection for output transformer. Okay, let's turn on the amp now and see what type of a plate voltage, plate current, and plate dissipation we have at the bias settings that were uh, on the amp when it arrived. I'm going to let the tubes warm up before I take them off standby. And here we go. This is a matched set of tubes, so uh, we would expect the plate current to be quite similar. And as you see, that plate current is actually quite low. If we want 70% of 35 watts, that's going to be 24.5 watts, and as you can see, we're nowhere near that. Um, we're down just a shade over 10. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and crank our bias pot up until we get a plate dissipation that is more befitting of tubes like this. I'm not going to go for the maximum, the uh, 24.5. Let's go just for the 21 maximum of for 6L6GCs. Okay, I cranked up the plate current to around 57 milliamps each uh, at about 367, 368 plate volts, which gives us a plate dissipation right around 21 watts. Okay, I can smell the tubes, I guess because they're new. Uh, they, are, they are putting out some heat, but they would at uh, 57 milliamps, but that's what these tubes are supposed to handle. Also I notice that the uh, plate voltage seems a little low for an amp like this. You'd expect it to be a little closer to 400. Um, but anyway, it looks like the tubes are handling this quite well. I see no red plating. Unless you look inside at the filaments and you can see the red inside there, but that's not the plate itself. So 
Um, I'm a little befuddled here. I don't really see anything wrong with this. Um, let's stop and take stock of what we have uh, discovered and see what else we can do. I've let these tubes run now for about 10 minutes and they're now in the shadows where if there were any red plating it would be very obvious. I sure don't see it. So I'm going to go reread the letter and see if I misunderstood the uh, symptoms. Also the bias is rock solid so we don't really have a coupling cap problem. Uh, if you did have a coupling cap that was leaking um, positive DC to the grid uh, you'd see these uh, the plate current would take off okay and the tube would eventually self-destruct but this stability to me is indicative of fully functional um, coupling caps. Okay, we have a fizzy sounding, generally unstable volume fluctuation. Of course, that could be any number of things in the preamp circuit for that matter. But um, ordered a new set of tubes, had the same issue, and looking at the power tubes, one was glowing differently while playing. Now, that sounds to me like red plating, but maybe not. Um, okay, then I guess what we'll have to do is plug in the rest of the tubes. Um, input a signal and see if we get volume fluctuation, uh, fizzy sound, and uh, instability. All right, the trusty audio signal generator is set to 20 times 10 or 200 cycles per second. And I'm inputting over here to that right hand pair of inputs. Um, and remember, this is the volume control for them, and this is the volume control for this pair. And uh, we have our tube set in, 12AY7 and two 12AX7s. They appear to be brand new. They're the uh, Mullard brand of uh, replica tubes. So uh, I've got it on, turned on here. Let's turn it on, off of standby and see what kind of sound we get uh, from our shop speaker. Let's leave it at a comfortable level. I have people complain because of the, the test tones. I'm trying to use a, one that's not particularly offensive to most ears. But anyway, I'm going to turn off the camera and sit here for 10 minutes and listen to this and see if there's any fluctuation. Well, five minutes have passed with no variation. Also, it's interesting when you turn up the tone controls, the treble has almost no effect because we're at 200 cycles per second. That's down in the bass range. Listen to the difference with the bass control. Now let's go to the presence. Very little effect. Conversely, if I use a 1000 cycle per second tone, the treble control has the effect, the bass control has very little, and we're up in the presence range. Very little effect though in the presence. It does appear though that the bass and treble controls are working beautifully. Alright, I've changed from the normal channel of these two inputs to the bright channel, and the results are the same. However, notice that the treble control has a lot more effect than it did in the normal channel. And the poor old presence control just doesn't do much. Okay, but the tone is consistent. I don't hear any fizziness. I'm thinking next I'm going to have to uh, apply some um, a guitar input to this and see if that uh, triggers whatever the issues are that the owner was complaining about. In our preceding video I introduced you to our new feral 
kitty cat named Missy, uh, about a five month old uh, little poor little wretch who showed up in the backyard starving to death and uh, looking pretty miserable and uh, she has really turned the corner here and just eats continuously gaining weight a lot like Casey did when we uh, found her emaciated um, her, we took her to get her fixed and her where they shaved her tummy is growing back nicely and she's adapting quite well to uh, workshop life aren't you Missy? Now, there's too much, too much food left in that bowl to pay any attention to the old fool. Um, but she's adapting quite well to life in the workshop, which includes, of course, sleeping and sharpening of the claws on a filthy carpet, uh, being present when the 34 Ford gets started up, uh, things of that sort. And uh, I think she's turning into a really good little workshop cat. So a little later, uh, once she's through eating about seven more bowls of food, I'll uh, entice her to uh, receive some uh, neck rubbing and some ear scratching and other things so you can get a better look at her. Okay, so stay tuned. I was out in front checking the mail. I just had to share this with you. Uh, my next door neighbor decided to prune his own oak tree to save a few bucks instead of paying somebody to do it. And I want you to see the lovely job he did. Um, we all know that when there's no bark on uh, a branch like that, that one's dead. Uh, and I'm glad the trash bell's there because that's where the whole tree's going to probably end up pretty soon. But anyway, I just thought you'd enjoy seeing that there's just no telling where foolishness will be found in the world. It can be as close as next door. Well, here's Mitzi having a quick bath after lunch. You see her little spot she has on her lip. It's sort of like a half of a Groucho mustache. Okay, which uh, I guess if she were male, I would call her Groucho, but she's not. Um, not only that, oh, there's a fly in the workshop now. She also has this spot at the base of her tail with a little white space and then when her black tail is out straight it looks exactly like an exclamation mark okay so I mean this cat you could admit I mean they don't make them like this anymore well after about 45 minutes of guitar playing through this amp I cannot get it to display any fizziness or volume instability so I'm waving the white flag here. I surrender. I, I cannot get this amp to act up. So what I'll do is just continue with the optimization processes and then uh, in our final audio demonstration we'll see for ourselves if the tone is good uh, or fizzy uh, and if the volume fluctuates. You know I've been racking my brain over this uh, issue with this amp. Uh, this is a very reliable customer who knows what he's talking about. He's telling me that this amp sounds fizzy, that the volume varies, uh, and yet it seems to work perfectly for me. Now, here's what I think the problem may be. I don't think these are the proper tubes for this circuit. I think these are tubes for a much more powerful circuit, more like a baseman or uh, like a super reverb or, or something like that um, because bear in mind that the super was a really an early amplifier design and it operated at relatively low plate current and plate voltage remember it used 5881's and they have a plate dissipation of around 23 watts not 35 watts like these tubes now I think to bias this amp up to where it would operate properly with these tubes would greatly stress the power transformer um, I think that biasing these tubes at 10 um, watts of plate dissipation as they were when they came in explains the fizzy uh, tone and and the uh, kind of irregular volume these tubes were operating at just a fraction of their probably what 20 30 percent bias 
uh, and we know that as the bias percentage goes down from optimum the tone suffers greatly so I think the issue was the wrong tubes and then with the completely wrong bias for the wrong tubes so here's what I advocate I'm going to order a pair of 5881s for this amp and see if when they're properly biased if we can't get great tone kind of a, a low uh, draw on our uh, power transformer so that it uh, will not overheat and see if we can't solve this problem and lo and behold as if by magic we get uh, a, our box from the tube depot uh, containing two uh, matched vintage Siemens 6L6 now these are labeled WGB but that is the equivalent of the 5881 okay so these should be the, the best possible tubes for this circuit let's install them and uh, check the bias and see what we think okay our new tubes are installed we see that they are very nicely balanced look at that boy that's really close and I've calculated a plate dissipation of right around 16 watts which should be ideal remember if these are uh, have a maximum plate dissipation of 23 watts then 16 is going to be just about right for 70 percent now I just don't see our power transformer having any great problems flowing around 40 or so um, milliamps of plate current to each of these tubes and the plate voltage is about where the schematic says it should be at around uh, 384 or so so this looks like a very comfortable fit for this amplifier okay I I really think that what we're doing here is a better idea than uh, biasing these hot enough to sound good and stressing the power transformer well you know I'm thoroughly impressed with the design and construction of the Victoria amp uh, one really kind of jarring deletion though that really surprised me is the fact that although this circuit has a filter choke it does not have screen resistors and as we discussed in the preceding video uh, any circuit with a filter choke should have uh, screen resistors to protect the power transformer from uh, screen shorts drawing so much current that they destroy the high voltage winding so I'm going to add in a pair of 470 ohm 1 watt screen resistors to this circuit uh, to bring it up to uh, the types of uh, specification that we expect from an amp of this quality and there we have the two screen resistors in place I simply removed the wiring from uh, pin 4 which is the screen uh, terminal uh, wired it up to the no contact uh, pin 1 and then ran the resistor from pin 1 to pin 4 on each tube uh, for those of you who are concerned that adding these resistors might reduce the screen voltage let's do a quick calculation to see how much voltage drop there is across these screen resistors okay normal screen current is around 5 milliamps and that's 0 0.005 amps resistance uh, is 470 ohms each so the uh, according to Ohm's law the voltage drop across each of the 470 ohm resistors will be a measly 2.35 volts which will not affect uh, amp performance in any way so uh, the addition of these resistors is a very positive uh, step toward protection of our very expensive power transformer and it will not alter the uh, performance of the amp in any way those of you desiring a more in-depth explanation of why these resistors are necessary on amps that have a filter choke please see the immediately preceding video on the blackface Princeton reverb it occurred to me with only a 4 ohm output here uh, and I only have an 8 ohm shop speaker why not connect that 8 ohm speaker output lead from the output transformer and 
put in an 8 ohm jack here so that the owner uh, has some flexibility, 8 ohm or 4 ohm. Um, also, I'll probably put a note here, it's one or the other, never both. Okay, so uh, it would be a nice little addition, I think. Alright, I've installed the 8 ohm uh, speaker jack and I've run that green wire up to it. Um, and now we have a 4 ohm and an 8 ohm output. I've tested them both and they're work, both working just fine. I had to disconnect the grounding leaf on the 4 ohm jack otherwise if you uh, were to plug only into the 8 ohm the 4 ohm would be shorting the output. Now neither of these are grounding jacks and we have a choice then of 8 ohm here, 4 ohm here. Now I have to label those outputs properly. There is the label. I think it makes things pretty clear and the addition of that 8 ohm jack makes the amp a little more versatile. Now we know with passive tone controls like we have in this circuit none of those tone controls will boost any frequency. All that happens is when you turn up the treble you're sending less of it to ground so more treble is present therefore it seems like you're boosting it. Okay with that in mind let's try to figure out what frequency range the presence control regulates. Now I have all the other tone controls turned down to zero and the volume is almost to zero and I have the audio generator at about 2,300 cycles per second. That's about 23 times 100. Okay, now I'm going to turn the volume up a bit and I know this will be annoying to some but you know just try to take one for the team, okay? Try to, to bear with us turn it up here at uh, a very low level. Now let's see if it increases when the presence control moves. Remember really there were no changes in other frequencies with the presence control. There you go. It gets much louder at a presence of 12. Now let's alter the frequency. Look at that drop off there's no apparent boost at 2000 there's your boost it goes up to 3 and at 4 it disappears so we're looking at about 2300 to 4000 cycles per second boost that's what your presence control is regulating well I couldn't resist and I made one last modification uh, to this circuit before we begin our audio testing and that is I installed the switchable NFB loop that I've been installing in all of the Fender amps I've been working on over the last many months. Okay, and it consists of this little small single pole single throw switch right here in series with uh, the wire from the with the 56k NFB resistor and the hot contact in the 4 ohm speaker output jack and you see it right here 56k and what I've done is I put the switch into this wire right here that connects to the hot contact for the 4 ohm output okay so now uh, the owner will have the benefit of both 4 and 8 ohm speaker output choices and also whether uh, he wants the NFB loop on or off. Now that we have our new tube set installed and biased I think it's time to subject this amp to a rather strenuous audio testing session to see if it does act up as the owner suggested uh, or if the um, replacement of those I think incorrect tubes uh, has solved the issue. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, we're all set up now for the audio test on our Victoria clone of the Fender 5F4 Super Amp. Uh, we have our SM57 microphone aimed at our uh, Jensen 12-inch uh, speaker. Everything's plugged in over here to the Victoria chassis. 
Uh, we've got Ollie and Jack all tuned up and ready to go, so without further ado, let's begin our audio demo.
Well, I guess that's about it uh, for this momentous video featuring the finely crafted Victoria clone of the Fender of 5 F4 Super Amplifier. To be honest, I'm not 100% positive that we resolved the uh, problem that the owner described, but you know how it is uh, when your car is making weird noises, it always quits when you take it to the mechanic. But we did discover a uh, issue with the 7581A uh, output tubes that were installed in the amp, uh, being that they were actually too powerful, uh, drew too much current, and were biased way too cold uh, to deliver decent tone. And they were replaced with a nicely matched pair of vintage 5881 tubes that were biased properly and uh, seemed to be performing perfectly. We installed screen resistors and throughout the testing procedure which went on for oh I'm gonna say a couple hours uh, at no time did the sound get fizzy or did the volume fluctuate so uh, it may be some external issue here uh, it could be bad contact maybe in uh, one of the input jacks something of that sort but I feel reasonably certain that it is not in the amp itself uh, this thing performed perfectly for us while it was here so I'm going to pack it up and return it and I want to take my uh, traditional moment or two here to thank all our PayPal contributors and Patreon patrons for uh, their generous support of our channel and keeping us on the air for another month should you like to join them uh, I will put links in the video description which will enable you to do so I also want to thank our generous viewers who sent us those fabulous gifts that Jack and uh, Casey had so much fun sniffing and we had uh, so much fun opening. Uh, as usual, our viewers are the best in the world and I just want to offer our sincerest thanks to you all. So that's it for this video production. Uh, I hope you stay tuned for future postings which should be in the near future. I also hope you enjoyed the little tidbits we threw in here and there as distractions and perhaps little educational tips. Um, and I also hope that you stay happy and healthy until we meet again in the near future in YouTube land. Bye for now.